so we are running about 5 minutes late we move on to the next uh, uh, session which is going to be chaired by dr adarsh chaudhry who is the chief of uh, gi surgery at medanta in gurugram and uh, the presenter uh, is dr rebala pradeep from aig pradeep can you come in yeah uh, dr adarsh please pradeep uh welcome and the stage is all yours can you see my slide sir dr pradeep's uh, uh, topic is indications and timing the of timing surgery. yes pradeep we can see uh, good evening uh, professor kapoor professor adarsh and professor saraswat so uh, i am going to present the uh, indications and timing of surgery in chronic pancreatitis a surgeon's perspective uh all of us know it's a inflammatory process involving the peripancreatic tissues and the treatment is challenging and all the treatment we directed towards chronic pancreatitis is only palliative and it is achieved by multidisciplinary approach and that's why the controversies happen the and one should realize these approaches are complementary and they are not competitive so you should know which one to go where and that is a so ultimately it is a patient is all of us should look at the patient's response not that i can do or it can do so most important is this they should be looked at a complementary than complementary competitive now let us look at the complications which require some sort of intervention this can be a, a medical or endoscopic or a surgical the most important component all of us look at is the pain which occurs 70 to 90% of patients and there are various complications like the biliary ductal stricture a diurnal stricture you can have a extra hepatic port life tension or a pseudo aneurysm and pseudo cyst that will disruption leading to pancreatic ascites and a doubtful pancreatic head mass to be inflammatory or a malignant and of course an exocrine endocrine insufficiency which requires mainly the medical treatment these are the complications and you have all the options of medical surgical and endoscopic now let's look at the pain which dr saras has already highlighted the common symptom is the pain and the mechanism of pain is uh, we do not understand it's poorly understood that's why that there are a lot of uh, failures is because we don't understand why the uh, these pain occurs the, the conventional old theory is that there is an obstruction ductal obstruction leading to increased pressure and parenchymal pressure and that leads to the pain by decompression of this obstruction should lead to the pain relief but it does not happen always a small percentage of patients even the duct is not dilated or even after decompression of the duct the pain continues and this probably is due to entrapment of sensory nerves or there can be an extensive pressure of a complication or a nociceptive transmission so where the pain may be actually away from the pancreas it is in the uh, spinal cord or in the cortex so we really do not understand the pain mechanism why it happens in chronic pancreatitis so as uh, the first speaker has highlighted the main important is stop all call at smoking and analgesics of nsaids uh, the who pains and the step of uh, their pattern and the narcotics should be restricted with the last options and you have the adjuncts like antioxidants and pregabalin and 30 to 60% of patients fail to respond to this conservative treatment during the course of the disease and they might end up in intervention options like endoscopy or eswl which sir has sort of highlighted and surgery of course in patients who do not uh, are not candidates for uh, endoscopic therapy or where endotherapy fails these patients will end up in surgery and the approach to this uh, surgical approach depends on the duct morphology the structures presence of stone load whether there is any inflammatory mass whether it is localized to one part of the pancreas or the whole pancreas or associate complications these are all the issues which decide what should be done in a patient so we look at eswl and endoscopy we had the uh, ag has a maximum number that recently as manu can has presented if you look at these uh, studies most of the studies are short term pain relief is very good but when you look at a long term the pain relief significantly drops down to less than 60% so one should all realize that a short term pain relief with endotherapy is very good and the relief is good particularly when the stone is confined to the head which a limited stone load and stricture confined to the head these are the cases probably an endotherapy or eswl will be beneficial if a, a big a huge stone load across the whole of pancreas are not ideal for a eswl endoscopy if you look at the 
conventional surgical results most of the results even late results of surgery are very good to the tune of 90% so we should compare the long term results of the surgery versus endotherapy where endotherapy long term results are not that good so then came the randomized trials which a lot of criticism was there the land and these randomized trials and they showed that though early results of pain relief is good with uh, with endotherapy but when you look at the long term results these surgery has got a better long term results for uh, the pain relief compared to the endotherapy then people started looking at why not first apply endotherapy and then once endotherapy fails refer the patient to surgery that is the step of approach so conservative treatment failures if the pain does not subside conservative treatment favorable morphology for endotherapy endotherapy in the form of uh, eswl stent and failure of this endotherapy to surgery the question is how long one should persist with endotherapy is it 6 months 1 year these patients continues to have pain in spite of uh, endotherapy frequent visits to the endoscopist for exchange of stents or putting new stents so when should you refer to a surgeon if you look at this uh, same study of the 5 years uh, after the coen study the pain relief of surgery was 80% um with surgery but endotherapy is only 38% and roughly about half of them are converted to surgery and number of procedures required when you persist with endotherapy is very high so sal they, they also sub uh, sub analysis was done salvage surgery that means where endotherapy failures where surgery was offered the pain relief was not very effective and the endocrine insufficiency was less frequent in those patients who were surgically treated so this is one of the important observations which they have found thinking that probably one should know when to refer surgery and if you want to refer surgery it should be done much earlier this is escape trial which is uh, another can, uh, clinical trial uh, randomized trial where 88 patients were studied with the dilated ducts uh, where they included only patients with short term opioid usage and 44 persons upfront surgery and 44 persons endoscopy first approach that means endoscopy failures will go for surgery in these patients so the follow up was only short term of 2 years the pain score was found to be low in upfront surgery and complete or partial pain relief was achieved in a greater in number of patients 58 percent in uh, uh, surg- uh, upfront surgery and 39 percent in uh, endoscopic uh, upfront so early surgical intervention for pain within 4 years after the onset of symptoms produces good results the choice of procedure should be dictated by the morphology of the duct and extent of pancreatic involvement early surgical intervention probably the efficacy of pain relief is good in these patients and probably there is a lot of debate whether it preserves the pancreatic function with the early surgery now coming to other complications like biliary stricture so this is a pancreatic inflammation which involves around the pancreas and this can lead to edema or even fibrosis and this can lead to bile duct narrowing this can be a transient or permanent or the associated cirrhosis sometimes can produce an extrinsic impression on the biliary duct system producing a stricture and the present most often they are asymptomatic and pain because of the stricture it can present as jaundice or cholangitis or a late presentation or improperly treated they can present a biliary cirrhosis so how will you approach these patients the mild fibrosis if it is a stable liver function test probably you can just hold on but if it is a edema usually it resolves and there is severe fibrosis or a recurrent acute attacks it can progress and lead to the complications the approach to the biliary structure can be observation or an endoscopy or a surgery depending on the extent or a progress of the stricture asymptomatic with mild dilatation mild elevation of liver enzymes can be observed and there when there is no other indication for surgery like no other complications close monitoring is mandatory those some some people suggest a liver biopsy every 6 months but not always agree on this of a serial liver biopsy every 6 months to pick up liver cirrhosis in these patients the symptomatic cholangitis requires an intervention associated biliary stones or a biopsy evidence of biliary cirrhosis the progression of obstruction leading to imaging evidence or a persistent jaundice 
for more than one month. Or if the alkaline phosphates is more than three times the normal and it persists for more than one month, these are the situations where one should intervene to prevent progression to cirrhosis. So endoscopic stenting is useful as a short term but not for a long term because long term stenting, we have the problems of stent blockage and recurrent cholangitis. Endoscopic stenting is reserved for high risk patients for surgery or probably bridged to stabilize the patient prior to surgery whereas nutritionally poor or cholangitis. So multiple, if at all you have to stand, multiple plastic stents are better as Sarsa has told and metal stents are initial better response but the problem will be difficult to retrieve when you want to remove your surgery is required in these patients. So if you look at the success rate of these uh, biliary strictures is not a great uh, long-term success is not that uh, great but though long-term success of a self expert metallic stents are much more than a plastic stents. But if you look at the surgery of biliary strictures, the excellent long-term results, acceptable uh, uh, mortality and morbidity and associated surgical problem can be simultaneously tackled when you surgically handle these biliary strictures. The procedure of choice is predominantly mainly duodenostomy and colidocodigenostomy, which is a ruin Y. If the obstruction is because of a pseudocyst, one can do the drainage of the pseudocyst. But if there is a head mass, probably a resectional procedure of the head mass can open up these bile ducts and might not require any drainage. So this is the algorithm for management of these. Uh, is, it basically depends on whether the pain is predominant or no. If pain is the predominant symptom, when there is, is there a jaundice or not? If there is a jaundice, probably one should consider a, a surgical drainage when there is a, a, a whether there's, if there is a mass, one should go for a resectional procedure. If there is no mass, a simple drainage with a pancreatic duct along with a biliary drainage is, is what is suggested. So most often, uh, we do a phrase and a hepatic jejunostomy of the same loop rather than a cordocodiodenostomy in these patients. Now, the other complication is a pseudocyst. Uh, most often, about 30, 9 to 30 percent of this spontaneous resolution but it is less common compared to the acute uh, pseudocysts occurring on acute pancreatitis because most of them will have a ductal communication and they have a complications around 10%. This cyst can produce compression of the CBD or a duodenum or it can involve the uh, mesentric mes mes venous system or it can rupture pancreatic ascites, bleed and infection or some of the complications these pseudocysts can develop. So, Sir, two, three minutes, please. Yeah. So high risk pseudocyst, uh, which is a more than four centimeters or an extra pancreatic uh, cyst should also be treated in these patients. These are some of the indications of uh, treating the pseudocyst. A complicated pseudocyst should always be treated or a symptomatic pseudocyst. Asymptomatic high risk cyst because of the fear of complications like a large cyst, extra pancreatic cyst should be treated. So the options are endoscopic versus surgical. We have a cyst depending on the anatomical location. And resectional surgery, particularly when you have to do a, when the disease is confined to the tail or head, a resectional procedure can also be considered in these options. The results of the endoscopic drainage is good with a, a failure rate of about 15% and similar results with the surgical results. So both endoscopic and surgical drainage have a high success rate. No good comparative studies are available with the endoscopy versus surgery in pseudocyst. A multidisciplinary approach should be tailored to the patient and the pathology. And another complication is a duodenal obstruction, which can be because of the edema or fibrosis or a pseudocyst. And uh, this is a long, smooth narrowing of the duodenum, which is producing an obstruction because of the inflamed pancreas. And it can be associated with biliary obstruction. The trial of conservative treatment for two weeks is advocated because edema, if it is because of the edema, it usually subsides. Otherwise, depending on the associated complications, you have to drain the bile duct along with the GJ or a duodenal genostomy. If there is a head mass associated with a duodenal obstruction, probably head resection or with or without drainage of the duodenum is advocated. The other complication is a mesentric venous thrombosis leading to portal hypertension presenting as a bleed or it can sometimes, there will not be any bleed, but they create problems for us to go in and operate for a uh, 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 pancreatic or jejunostomy or a bile ductal drainage. So morphology of this mesentric venous thrombosis, they can present with only portal hypertension without collaterals, 
or the extensive collaterals for a surgeon it makes very uh, the surgery becomes very difficult and bloody and uh, the way the most usual difficulties one encounters is identification of the pancreatic tract when there are collaterals and uh, the bleed during head pouring or identification of the bile duct the approach is a meticulous slow approach with uh, in these patients or sometimes when the, when the surgery becomes more difficult probably a prophylactic central shunt followed by the definitive surgery the it can other presentation is a missent uh, venous thrombosis is a bleed so endotherapy is the first option when surgery is reserved when the endotherapy failures or if the portal hypertension is because of the splenic vein thrombosis probably a splenectomy is a permanent uh, answer to this so this is the algorithm which professor ramesh has advocated in his publication saying that when there is a, a normal liver with various bleed it is an endotherapy if there is a no bleed uh, with the pancreatic pain the pancreatic procedure is advocated uh, but uh, the surgery becomes more technically more challenging because of these dilated collaterals a meticulous approach or sometimes we can do a prophylactic uh, shunt followed by surgery at a later date to conclude early surgical intervention for pain within 4 years after the onset of symptoms good long term results and the choice of procedure is by the morphology of the duct and extent of pancreatic involvement early surgical intervention probably might preserve the pancreatic function and biliary early intervention in a biliary stricture will prevent biliary cirrhosis and pancreatic head mass requires early intervention particularly when the underlying malignancy cannot be excluded with confidence symptomatic high risk pseudocyst needs intervention endoscopic or surgical treatment depends on the location of the cyst presence of another indication for surgery a uh, portal hypertension with collaterals need meticulous surgery or a stage surgery with a shunt and bleeding varices requires an endotherapy or a left side portal hypertension requires splenectomy to me for a permanent cure thanks dr adarsh maybe we can take the questions first and then your comments yeah yeah sure we can go ahead with the questions yeah so uh, there is a question by dr vijay bada is intervention whether endoscopic or surgical in patients with no pain justified with an intent of organ preservation especially in a fibrotic disease because he says that most of them eventually will end up with some intervention so maybe both pradeep and dr saraswat can take this i i don't think uh, uh, without pain without any complication right now there is no enough data to suggest that uh the surgery is going to preserve the pancreatic function so until and unless we have enough data i think we can't say with uh, confidence that we should intervene in these patients what about endoscopic intervention dr saraswat would you intervene i think yeah i think the same uh, rule holds true uh, all therapies symptom based it's targeted at problems not prevention there are no data to show that any intervention will improve the outcome the data that uh, pradeep mentioned and that i had also referred to early intervention in a symptomatic patient within months or maybe an year or two that would probably mean relatively early disease in the gland there you can preserve pancreatic function and prevent progression by relieving obstruction but uh, up front to undertake therapy in an asymptomatic person with that intent well let the evidence emerge before any attempt is made in that direction in a routine manner Dr. Sadik is there. Sadik, uh, is there some soft evidence that uh, there may be some improvement in the function? And second, can there be? Is there an evidence that there could be reduction in the risk of malignancy? Would you like to come in, Sadik? If you are there, because I remember in one of his presentations, Sadik showed a slide which I then borrowed from him also. where there was of course it was not a very good uh, or very uh, convincing evidence but there was soft evidence a uh, winner there was a paper from a japanese yes, study yes. there is a japanese yes. study which showed that if you is a long term follow up but uh, i don't think there is any convincing evidence of that there is a japanese study which said that. okay yeah any more questions yeah there are there are some other questions uh, let me just i think they are in the chat uh, so should you do a gtt to unmask a borderline endocrine insufficiency in patients who have no pain no diabetes with pt <laughs> dilatation and calculi maybe dr saraswat can take that glucose tolerance test i think you do hba1c much better and then you can also do c uh, peptide things that c peptide gives you a better indication of early diabetes no but i mean what exactly is the intention behind identifying early diabetes one needs to be clear 
Are you going to offer this person surgical or endoscopic intervention that we've already discussed? And that is not the case. We will not be offering them uh, this treatment. And the only evidence is when obstructive pancreatitis with pain, if you intervene early, you preserve pancreatic function. That does not automatically allow you to infer that will also confer similar benefits. You may have logic with you, but you don't have evidence with you. So I don't think we can intervene uh, on logic alone. Uh, uh, Dr. Puneet Dhar, who was to be the chief monitor, he was busy in a case uh, which went on long, so he's just joined. Uh, Puneet, would you like to uh, 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 say what you have said in the chat box? Please come in. <laughs> no, I just, I just wanted to uh, just say that for symptomatic patients, there's soft evidence, especially in non-alcoholic, uh, that there might be overall organ... Uh, uh, you know, relative preservation if we intervene early. But in asymptomatic, to justify that, as Dr. Saraswat said, you know, I, I just echoing the same words. Absolutely agree. It's uh, it's no point in doing it if uh, uh, for asymptomatic. There is a, I mean, the, the wording of that question is that uh, how can I make this patient into a surgical patient? That's incorrect. The, the hint is, uh, is probably wrong because I've asked this in a lot of uh, forums, you know, the kids... Uh, uh, that what will you do? This is full of patient had uh, pain two years back. Now he's asymptomatic. So a lot of them say it's full of stones. I do a pu pusto and all that, you know, looking at the uh, CT scan. So uh, in every exam, they say that. So I think that's very important to emphasize as Pradeep has said also, as well as Dr. Saraswat. Uh, Dr. Adarsh, your concluding remarks, please. Uh, you are muted. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question to Pradeep? Yes, please. Uh, Pradeep, uh, we, have, we rarely talk about pain in patients who have undilated time. Yeah. So it's a very sad situation, and you know people publish papers, and uh, but then if you see in real life scenario, these patients don't do well. What is your view on that? Yes, they don't do well. The endoscopist is reluctant to operate. The surgeon is reluctant to operate. Yeah. So, so because we know the results are poor and unfortunate patients, probably they they most of them will land up in medical treatment and they get addicted to many of these uh, these things. I think I you 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 covered the subject very well, and I think somebody Adarsh, before you before you make comment, uh, Himanshi has sent me a question, uh, which I will request uh, Pradeep to take follow up for six to twelve months, and if the biopsy shows biliary cirrhosis, does it resolve with surgery? Question seems to be incomplete, but uh, I suppose the student wants to know that if there is evidence of uh, secondary biliary cirrhosis, would it resolve if you do the biliary drainage? Early, early fibrotic changes, probably they have shown that it reverses, but once full established cirrhosis is not going to reverse. And Dr. Uh, Ramesh has made a comment. Take that also. Dr. Yes, Dr. Ramesh has made a comment that he doesn't agree that undilated ducts give bad results. So, but in hands of ordinary mortals like us, <laughs> uh, they don't give good results. So, we really need to understand how it works uh, elsewhere. But in most of our Centers, undilated ducts don't give good results. Concluding remarks, please. So, Pradeep, I absolutely enjoyed your talk and think for a very balanced presentation. The overriding message is that mere presence of a dilated duct and stones is not an indication for surgery. So, I think that's the primary uh, message of your talk. I absolutely enjoyed it and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ramesh, since I have a minute, uh, would you like to come in and say that what surgical procedure would you do in an undilated duct? Dr. H. Ramesh? Uh, I, I would do a fray procedure and uh, an undilated duct, uh, if, if one takes adequate care to identify the duct and drain it, uh, the results in the long term have been good. I think... Uh, Undilated deck, uh, Adarsh's uh, bad experience may also stem from the fact that many of these patients have been already intervened. Uh, Dr. Sharma made a wonderful comment that an undilated duct mustn't attract endotherapy. And uh, we've had instances where post-endotherapy patients have had such severe pain that we had to remove the stents in a hurry and then soon after consider surgical treatment. And... Uh, uh I'm sorry, Adarsh. We had sorry, no, sorry, if you're finished. Ramesh, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, so, some people, you, since you see so many of these patients, do you believe that patients who have undilated ducts, if followed up for a long time, with develop dilated ducts? Uh, the question is a very difficult one to answer because many of these patients, the, there is no com uh, correlation between ductal diameter and the severity of pain. 
that's what, absolutely that's, that's, that's a paper I, we are I about absolutely to publish. Agree. So, if you have a patient who has an undilated duct but who has severe pain which is disabling, inter, in, mm. interfering with his uh, quality of life, you have got to tackle it. My, I understand. My, my request and my plea is that we shall not do 95% pancreatectomy, yeah, yeah, we shall course, not do whipple resections, but we shall do coring with, uh, with lateral drainage, which is eminently doable. I agree. But because but I once talked to Pramod Garg. Pramod Garg says, from AIMS says that these undilated duct patients, if you follow them up for a long time, eventually the duct dilates. I don't agree with that. No, I don't agree either. There are many no. patients who have grossly dilated duct, but who have never had pain. So you, don't, you don't need to intervene the, in them either. Agree. We intervene the symptomatic patient and agree. the complicated patient, not the, the morphology of the gland. Thank you so much. Thank others, you. others, I mean, the only data that... Uh, well, I'm wondering that uh, Dr. Ramesh is saying that he has excellent uh, results with a free procedure in uh, non-dilated ducts. Um, the only data we have, and if we, I am not confusing undilated with small duct pancreatitis, uh, we have we have from Hamburg, and the long-term right. results with the V-shape excision have been excellent. But these are the only center so far I know that has published this data. But on the other mean, hand, we, we can have a cephalic mass without a duct dilation and we can have a shrinking head with ma major duct dilation. So, so those with a shrinking head, in my personal experience and from the data of uh, 1,400 chronic pancreatitis, those with a small shrinking head have more severe pain and do benefit truly from the coring, whether duct dilation is present or not. No, my, my question is to a patient who has no head mass, but simply an undilated duct has severe pain. If it's a head mass, there is no problem. We can core yeah. it. But I'm talking of a patient whose duct is 3 millimeter, has no head mass, but has severe pain. So what yeah. do we do to this may, patient? May, may I answer that? Yeah. Yes, I, would, I, I would still core the head, use the head coring to detect the, uh, the duct. And no, then, Ramesh, and then there is no head mass. How can you? Core? I, I don't need a head mass to core it. I core no, all the normal, but but doctor, core Ramesh, a normal pancreatic duct. That that doctor is the Ramesh, yeah. That's that's as a as a group. Your results in the dilated duct versus your results in terms of pain relief in this subgroup where the duct is not dilated, not drainable, as others said by ordinary mortals. Uh, is there a difference or you achieve the same results in the undilated? In, in 2003, we published the, the intermediate term results, and uh, which is a uh, median of about 40 months. And uh, it was similar. Right now, we have long term results, which also substantiate the same. So if you've got a good, good enough okay. drainage of the pan pancreatic gland and the duct, you can have a good result. Uh, Yogesh. Why nobody yes. in the world else could do a V-shape excision apart from Hamburg? Well, V-shape excision. Yeah. V no, honestly, V-shape excision has been our uh, um, standard procedure for chronic pancreatitis. So even in with cephalic mass, we do combine with the anchoring of the head area, the entire gland uh, uh, is addressed with a V-shape. Yogi, yeah, what Dr. Uh, Adarsh is asking that why yeah. it has not become popular with other centers, either in Germany or outside Germany. May I step in and say that I did try to do the V-shaped excision in the undilated duct, but then I found yeah. the duct, so I didn't have to do a V-shaped excision. I, I, I used it as a backup procedure in case I didn't find the duct at all, and I just had to create a V-shaped gutter in the pancreas, I think, but I didn't have I, to do that. I think we need thank to, you so we, much, Vinay. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 Pradeep.